reading from the Gospel according to Luke, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Listen for the Word of God in these words of Scripture. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus said to them, oh, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, A friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within the house, Don't bother me. The door is already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus says, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? For the Word of God and its promise and covenant. Thanks be to God. May we pray together. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, enlighten us with your celestial fire. For if you, our parents, are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you, our parent, are not with us, then nothing else matters. Give to us when we ask. Help us to find when we are seeking. And when we knock or ring your doorbell, Will you please open the door? We ask these things in the name of your beloved. Amen. It has been a minute since we have last seen Jesus pray. Luke talks of Jesus praying more than any other gospeler, which, which makes me think that Luke has an agenda to communicate to his hearers and readers about what it means to petition the divine. Consider for a moment in this brief history. One, when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. Two, when crowds would gather to hear Jesus and be cured by him, Jesus would sneak off into deserted places to pray. There he goes again, I'm sure that people would say in his head, always in the clouds. Three, before Jesus chose the twelve disciples, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night once, when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them the most important question in the gospel. Who am I? Four, at one of the most significant turning points in the gospel, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James, and went up to the mountain to pray, and while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling and white. Hear what I mean? 
Jesus is one praying dude. But do you know what's like frustrating? For all of that praying, nobody knows one word of Jesus' prayers. If Jesus spoke at all. Hmm. Maybe sound of sheer silence and not a cacophony of consonants and characters filled Jesus' prayers. Could it be that the lack of ceaseless prayer is far more important than the words we say? What is Luke doing when his monograph overwhelmingly speaks of prayer? Of this much, we can be sure, Luke has an agenda, as every storyteller does, but his purpose in this pericope is more than instruction on how to live and even how to pray. Luke's first and foremost, foremost priority is to tell us about the God to whom Jesus prays. At the beginning of today's scriptural lesson, Jesus is praying in a certain place. It could have been any place, I guess. We have seen pictures of Jesus praying, most of which are romanticized paintings of a glowing, fair-skinned, 30-year-old man with a perfectly groomed beard and a head of wavy brown locks that would make for a great gardening fruit tea champagne conditioner commercial. <laughs> Terrible paintings aside, can we imagine Jesus walking an ancient labyrinth path, each step winding in and out of the circle on the landscape of those deserted places he so often frequented? Did Jesus open his arms wide when he ascended to the top of the mountain? Or maybe, maybe it was Jesus' posture, his stillness, his intensity of meditation that no one would dare interrupt. Whatever the appearance, the disciples certainly recognized Jesus at prayer because of how frequently he engaged in the activity. After Jesus had finished praying, one brave and curious disciple asked, Hey, Jesus, I mean, Lord, how did you do that? Like, can you teach us, you know, how to pray? And if we cannot pray like you, then maybe we can pray like John's followers? They seem to be good at it. John's disciples say the, the right words, and they're not long-winded. But if you, Rabbi, teach us to pray, well, that will be life to you. Because you know, Jesus, prayer changes things. And even if things don't change as we like, prayer is transforming. And that would be enough to keep us going in the midst of circumstances that persist. What do you say, Jesus? Literally, what do you say when you pray? Ever the teacher, Jesus answers, listen carefully and repeat after me for the word. Our Father and the disciples respond. Jesus leads a call-and-response style of prayer that is a common practice in the black church tradition. No amen concludes the prayer. But I imagine at least one disciple says, Wait a minute, Jesus. I mean, Lord, that's it? We thought the prayer would be longer, more florid, and grandiose. We've heard through the grapevine that there are other versions of this prayer of yours that have a bigger word count. And we've been told, Jesus, I mean, Lord, the bigger is better. I'm sure Jesus face palms at this moment with his disciples. They missed it. God love them. So obsessed with the words of the prayer, they failed to grasp Jesus, I mean, the Lord's scandalous agenda. A message that Luke shares with us even now. Is Jesus subverting the norm when he says that the Holy One of old is to be as intimately known as a loving parent? Is Jesus telling disciples and us that God's reign is coming right now, evidence to the contrary? Perhaps most shocking. 
talking is that this holy parent, mother and father of us all, gives enough bread for today and for tomorrow, forgives us of sin just as we, on our very best day, forgive everyone indebted to us. Finally, this holy one is not to bring us to the time of trial. Could Jesus' hidden scheme in this prayer be that God gives good gifts, the very best gifts, to children? Let me tell you a story, and Jesus says, Stop me if you've heard this one. Let's say one of you has a friend, and you go to that friend's house at O oh, Dark 30, and you press the black button on your friend's newly installed Amazon Prime Day purchase ring doorbell. Now, as you may have guessed, I, your pastor, have just bought and installed a ring doorbell on my front porch. Whenever someone presses the button, and no matter where I am in the world, the interior chime will sound, and an alert will come across my iPhone. There's a camera inside the doorbell, so I can see the person on my phone, which is a nice security measure. I can talk through my cell phone, which will play through the speaker and hidden inside the slim, sleek, silver doorbell. <laughs> and the person can respond. Or I can say nothing to the ringer of the bell and wait for the ADT security system salesperson to get a clue that for the fifth time I am not interested in home protection for $39.95 a month. <laughs> but I digress. Jesus continues the story, pardoning, pardoning my interruption. The person rings the doorbell, and the owner's cell phone wakes him from his second cycle of REM sleep. The ringer says, hey, friend, uh, lend me three loaves of bread, for we have unexpected company that did not call or text ahead of their arrival, and the refrigerator and pantry are bone dry. The owner answers angrily in cleaned-up language appropriate for church in the Bible. Don't bother me. The door's locked, and my children are sound asleep, including the infant, and if you knew how long that took, you would not be ringing my doorbell. I can't and won't get up and give you anything. Abrupt, curt, and inhospitable, the homeowner's words could not have been clearer. Except the neighbor on the front porch does not listen. He rings the bell again and again and again, incessantly as fast as he could match the button and arise to be depressed again and again. He has no shame whatsoever. He is desperate and he does not take no for an answer. The constant ringing is blowing up the owner's cell phone and waking up the children, including the infant, who is finally beginning to sleep through the whole night. I pause here again to interject and caution everyone that this may not be the thing to try at home. And if you have the unholy idea of trying this at 136 Barrington Court <laughs> at an ungodly hour of the night, I cannot promise you a pastoral answer. <laughs> Jesus resumes the story suspicious of my continuing disruptions of his agenda. Jesus says, because of the neighbor's shameless nerve in ringing the bell, the owner will get up and give the neighbor whatever he needs. Jewish custom would have mandated hospitality from the neighbor who had the unexpected company. Except his food supply has run out and there are no left. Furthermore, Jewish law would have required that the owner, even in the midst of his deep sleep, honor his neighbor's late-night request for food. There's a mandatory minimum. If you have bread, share it. If you have anything good that is yours to give away, or at least share, then do it. Even at midnight, when most everyone is fast asleep, 
Anything less than gracious hospitality would be absurd for a disciple of Christ. The required code of honor rises equal to the height of the neighbor's shamelessness and ringing <clears throat> joy. The disciples respond to Jesus with blank stares. What does this have to do with prayer, Jesus? I mean, Lord, we don't understand. Neighbors and doorbells are all fine and good, and we understand what it means to be a good neighbor, kind of, but we're still fuzzy on this whole prayer thing. Jesus could have face palmed again, but he opts for a direct answer. Here it is. Let me break it down for you like this, real simple. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. For everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there any parent among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you, imperfect as you are, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will God give the best gifts to those who ask? Here's the thing. Children are asking. Many children and youth leave homes of abuse and neglect, or perhaps they are traumatized in another way. Maybe both. Whatever their circumstance, young persons metaphorically ring the doorbell of the Cleveland Christian home at all hours. If the children don't ring the doorbell themselves, their caseworkers do, because they are shameless in their fierce advocacy for children. When the Cleveland Christian home answers, when they open the door, they give the children fish in the form of shelter, food and education, and an egg in the form of mental health care, art, therapy, and unconditional love. Never would the Cleveland Christian home give out a scorpion or a snake. Because we are long supporters of the Cleveland Christian home, we share in the work of promoting the health and well-being children. What do you think? If the Cleveland Christian home knows how to give good gifts to children, how much more, then, will God give to those who ask? Here's another thing. Other children are asking, too, for fish in the form of asylum and an egg in the form of freedom. These children are leaving homes where gang violence is a daily reality. Drug cartels are common, and sexual violence and trafficking is the norm. They shamelessly ring the doorbells at our borders at all hours. On our behalf, our government answers, and we hand them a snake in the form of an overcrowded detention center and a scorpion in the form of separation from biological family. In spite of our nation's creed of liberty and justice for all, we have ceased giving good gifts to children. We would fail the hospitality standards common to Jesus and his disciples. If we then, who are evil, cannot give good gifts to children, do we assume that God can do no better or worse? That God agrees with us when we withhold good gifts from God's children? Who among us would want to pray to a parent like that? This text, while teaching us how to pray, does so much more.
truly Jesus is telling us who God is. And if we can capture a sense of who God is, a loving parent who likes to give good gifts to children, then we understand who we are as God's children and the hospitality required of us as disciples of Christ when the door bell rings. Ah, someone's at the door now. How will we answer? Let us answer like God, a benevolent parent who gives good gifts, the best gifts, to all the children, all the children of